About two or three weeks ago, we put out a video going over Duramax engines, and we covered everything from the LB7 all the way up to the L5P and even engines before that with the 6.2 and 6.5 Detroit diesel engine. But in that video, we didn't go over the new small Duramax engines. GM now offers a 2.8 liter and a 3 liter Duramax engine. We did not cover either of those in that video. So for that reason, and the fact that I think the three liter Duramax is incredibly interesting and a lot more interesting than other half ton diesel engines, we're gonna take a look at the LM2. So get your popcorn, get comfy, because today I'm gonna tell you everything you need to know about the GM LM2, which is the three liter Duramax engine. Other than the name, this three liter engine actually shares very little with the 2.8 liter Duramax and the 6.6 .6 liter Duramax found in the Colorado and Canyon and then the 2500, 3500, 4500 trucks respectively. It's a clean sheet design from the air intake down to the engine mounts. Very, very few common things were used from other Duramax engines. We've optimized everything in this engine's design to fit into the new generation Silverado while incorporating advanced combustion and emissions technologies to optimize performance and efficiency, said John Barta, assistant chief engineer of the new Duramax engine. I think it's also worth noting at this point that GM did not develop this engine on their own. It was actually a joint collaboration with Opel, the German automaker that GM owned all the way up until 2017. And the LM2 shares a similar architecture with two smaller Opel engines, but simply scaled up to an inline six design. GM developed this engine for use in their half ton trucks for the same reason that Ford, Ram, and Nissan also developed small diesel engines for their half ton trucks, which is a gap in the market. If you wanted a diesel engine in your truck, you had no choice but to purchase a three quarter ton or higher truck. While those big trucks like the 2500 and 3500, while they're great at getting work done, you know, towing, hauling, just getting general work done. If you're like a general contractor or a landscaper or what have you, they're great for that. But as a daily driver, they're not particularly good. And for the majority of consumers, they're just daily driving. They're just driving this truck to work or to their office or you know what have you. So they don't necessarily need the benefits of a 2500 or 3500 truck. On top of that, those trucks are physically big, so they're harder to park, they're harder to drive. They have really stiff suspension for towing and hauling, so they don't drive particularly great. So overall, a 1500 truck is much better suited for daily driving. That's something that you and I probably already know. But if you wanted a diesel engine, it just wasn't a thing. There was no diesel engine for your 1500 truck. So you were stuck with the gas engine options. So GM put together this engine, which is the LM2. It was designed for use in half ton trucks and competes directly with Ram's three liter eco diesel and Ford's three liter power stroke. What makes this engine so much different as compared to the other three liter diesel engines on the market is that the LM2 uses a much different configuration. The LM2 is an inline six, making it the only inline six engine in this segment. Now there's a lot of benefits to using an inline six configuration, especially in the context of a diesel engine, which is why you'll typically find this configuration in commercial applications like semi trucks but we'll get more into that later in the video. So starting with the basics, we're looking at a three liter inline six engine with a 36,000 PSI common rail injection system, an all aluminum cylinder head with dual overhead cams and four valves per cylinder, an aluminum cylinder block with an 84 millimeter bore and a 90 millimeter stroke, a compression ratio of 15 to one, forged steel connecting rods, forged steel crankshaft, and hyper eutectic pistons. Other things worth noting are the ceramic glow plugs, which aid in cold starts, and reduce cold start emissions, the water to air intercooling, variable length intake manifold, and all of that equals out to a whopping 277 horsepower and 460 pound-feet of torque. To get into more detail, let's start with the cylinder head and move our way down. As mentioned a moment ago, the LM2 features one large aluminum cylinder head. GM used aluminum because of its weight saving benefits and the thermal benefits. Keeping the head cool has a big impact on performance and efficiency. Plus, since this engine was meant to be used in half ton trucks, it needs to be quite a bit lighter in weight than the larger 6.6 .6 Duramax engines. Inside the head, you'll find two camshafts, four valves per cylinder, 1.12 inch intake valves and 0.97 inch exhaust valves. And this engine flows from left to right. So you have the exhaust manifold on the passenger side of the truck and the intake manifold on the driver side of the truck. With that, GM mounted the turbo very close to the head which means you have very short runners leading to the turbo, which has some big benefits and a few drawbacks, but it mostly means a quicker spooling turbo. One of the more iffy parts on the LM2 is how the cams are driven, which is a rear mounted system. 
meaning if anything happens with it or you need any maintenance, your transmission has to come off in order to access anything. On top of that, this whole system, which includes a high pressure fuel pump and both cams, is all chain driven. For a lot of diesel enthusiasts, that's a deal breaker because other aught engines offer a superior gear driven system, which is much stronger. With this system, if the chain needs to be replaced or the head pulled off the engine or the high pressure fuel pump needs to be replaced, it all means it's way more difficult to complete those jobs because it's rear mounted instead of being at the front of the engine. You might be wondering why did GM bother putting the entire valve train system, right? All the cams, the gears, all of that, it's all driven at the back of the motor why would they do that? And the answer is actually really simple. It's just packaging. You have to remember this is an inline six engine and really the engine bay for these trucks, if you look at like Silverado, Tahoe, Suburban, those engine bays were meant for V6 and V8 engines. If you were to take a V8 engine, it's only four cylinders long, but an inline six is six cylinders long. So you have a very, very long engine in an engine bay that is not designed for a long engine. That makes it really difficult to fit this engine in these applications because you're sandwiched in between the firewall and the core support. So by moving the entire system to the rear of the motor rather than the front of the motor where it is on pretty much all other engines, they were able to save a little bit of space and make this engine fit a little bit better in the engine bay. Moving on from the head, let's take a quick look at the intake manifold and the turbocharger. The variable intake manifold is one of the features on the LM2 that GM really pushed as a big selling point to show that this engine had more advanced features than what the competition was offering at the time. This is simply a dual pathway system with electronically controlled flaps one per cylinder. When the flaps operate, it changes the path of the airflow, which leads to either shorter or longer intake runners. This optimizes the airflow into the engine and improves performance and responsiveness across the RPM band, particularly at low engine speeds. The turbocharger isn't anything crazy at all. It's just a variable geometry turbocharger supplied by Garrett. If you didn't already know, VGTs work by using movable vanes to effectively change the size of the turbocharger, which has a big impact on how quickly it spools up and how much boost pressure it can produce at certain RPMs, which simply means you have the benefit of both a small and a big turbo in one system. Okay, with that out of the way, let's move down to the cylinder block and the internals of the engine. As mentioned earlier in the video, the block of the LM2 is constructed from cast aluminum for the same reason that the head is, which is weight and thermal efficiency. It's also worth noting that the LM2 has a different end goal as compared to larger diesel engines like the L5P Duramax, so it doesn't need an iron or a CGI block. Aluminum is more than strong enough in this application because the target power levels are much lower than the bigger Duramax engines. More specifically in regards to weight, GM claims using aluminum for this engine saves approximately 25% of the weight over a comparable cast iron engine block. Inside the block, GM is using iron cylinder liners for better long-term durability. Furthermore, the block uses a deep skirt design, which simply means the block casting extends below the crankshaft center line to aid in block stiffness. It's complemented by a stiffness enhancing aluminum lower crankcase extension attached to the main bearing caps. Speaking of which, there are seven nodular iron main bearing caps holding the rotating assembly in place. The rotating assembly itself consists of a forged steel crankshaft, forged steel connecting rods, and hyper-eutectic aluminum pistons. The pistons themselves get the, give the engine a relatively moderate 15 to 1 compression ratio, and all of this simply means that the block and the internals on the LM2 are actually pretty decent for a modern diesel engine. Next, let's take a quick look at the injection system. As far as I can tell, the LM2 uses a denso supplied fuel injection system like the L5P, but I cannot 100% confirm that no matter how much searching I did all over the internet. If so if somebody out there knows for sure if the LM2 uses a denso supplied system, please let me know down in the comments. If it is a denso supplied system, is it the same as the HP4 pump found on the L5P or is it something else from them? If anybody out there knows, please let me know down in the comments below because for the life of me, I cannot find any information regarding who makes this injection system. This common rail injection system peaks out at 36,250 PSI, which is one of the factors that allows the LM2 to generate as much power as it does. This injection system features nine hole nozzles that can fire up to 10 times per combustion cycle, which simply means more consistent and stable combustion performance ultimately meaning a quieter, smoother, and better performing engine. The oiling system is another point on this engine that a lot of people are iffy with because it's also rear driven just like the valve train is. And on top of it being rear driven, it uses a belt that has a 150,000 mile replacement interval. That means that literally every 150,000 miles, no matter like if you want to or not, you're supposed to pull the transmission and transfer case just to replace the belt. 
Understandably, this pisses a lot of people off. The pump itself is a little interesting in how it works because it's a variable pressure system and continuously changes the displacement to optimize oil pressure based on engine speed and load, which basically means it doesn't move more oil than it really needs to. Oil jets located in the block are used for performance and temperature control, and they simply work by spraying oil at the bottom of the pistons to help keep them cool. This allows the engine to produce more power without overwhelming the pistons because more power equals more heat. Speaking of heat, that actually brings us to another interesting point on the LM2, which is the active thermal management system. This active thermal management system is deployed to help warm the engine quicker in cold climates, as well as maintain optimal engine temperature for improved performance and emissions output. As part of this system, coolant flow is split between the head and the block. And this whole system works by using three valves to distribute coolant in areas where it's needed most. It sends heat where it's needed to warm up the engine to reduce friction and heat the passenger cabin or cool it when needed for high power operation. Moving all the coolant around is a conventional style water pump and it's the ECM that actually controls the valves that direct the coolant around the engine. And it's based on a number of coolant temperature sensors throughout the engine, including a temp sensor for the block, the head, in engine inlet and outlet, radiator outlet and heater core inlet and outlet and a few others moving on let's take a look at the worst part of any modern diesel engine and that's the emission systems starting with the egr gm actually changed things up quite a bit because the lm2 uses a new low pressure egr system where traditionally egr systems are strictly high pressure it recirculates gases between low pressure points in the exhaust system which is downstream of the dpf and after the compressor inlet when the low pressure EGR is activated by an electronically controlled valve, the engine burns the exhaust gas that has already passed through the particulate filter. That increases the turbocharger's efficiency, which helps increase the overall vehicle efficiency without deteriorating the rate of particulate matter emitted by the engine. And if you didn't already know, the EGR system basically just diverts some of the exhaust gases back into the intake, which ultimately lowers combustion temperature. The LM2 also features a diesel particulate filter, or DPF, which captures excessive exhaust soot and burns it off through a regeneration mode, as well as a selective catalyst reduction system with diesel exhaust fluid injection. It's a little too soon to know how these emission systems will fare in the long term, but looking at other examples, I'm pretty confident that these systems will become reliability issues down the line. And in terms of major issues, it's also a little bit too soon to know all of them, but there definitely seems to be a no start issue or a long crank issue popping up on some of these truck, which appears to be related to the camshaft position sensor, but it also seems to be intermittent and it's not always the cam position sensor. What's really annoying about this issue is that if it is the cam position sensor, it requires the transmission to be removed in order to access it, which also means that the cab will probably have to be pulled depending on the application. So that's pretty much all I've got for you guys today regarding the LM2 Duramax engine. It's a really cool little engine. I love that it's an inline six. I think that's a much better configuration for diesel engines. It's a much better configuration for gas engines as well for a variety of reasons. And that's why you typically see inline six engines used in semi trucks because especially for diesel applications, it is the better configuration. So it's really cool to see them use that. If you guys enjoyed the video, be sure to smash the thumbs up button because it really helps me out. Get subscribed so you don't miss out on future videos. Check out some of the other videos on the channel and I'll see you guys in the next one.